At the source of the canal, there is a river, the river Alzo. The story begins up here in the Montagne Noire, the southernmost tip of the Massif Central. Here at the source of the river Alzo, in a landscape that hardly recalls southern France, began the great adventure of the Canal of the South, the Canal du Midi. To collect enough water to feed the highest point on the canal at Nohouz, the man behind the plan, Pierre Paul Riquet, had the idea of connecting all the rivers that ran down from the Montagne Noire. The irrigation channel winds its way round the mountain like a rainwater gutter on both its Atlantic and Mediterranean sides. Then it heads for the watershed at Nohouz, so the water can flow both ways to the two seas. For 30 kilometers from the source of the Alzo, almost as far as the town of Revel, the mountain channel leads to the San Ferriol Dam. Building began in 1667 on what was then the largest earth dam in Europe and probably the world. It holds six million cubic meters, enough to fill the Canal du Midi. From Saint Ferriol, a second channel brings the precious liquid down towards the plain and the Nourouz watershed. From the boatsman's point of view, the journey begins in Toulouse, far to the west of the Montagne Noire. Toulouse, on the river Garonne, is the start of the waterway that leads to the Mediterranean at Set or Narbonne. All the waterways meet in Toulouse. On the left, the Canal Latéral heads down the valley of the Garonne to Bordeaux. The Canal du Midi starts at this arch, with, on the right, the short Canal de Brienne, linking both canals to the River Garonne. The marble bas-relief by Luca in 1775 symbolizes the union of the two seas. Neptune, fertility, abundance. This was the swan song of the Ancien Regime, soon to be swept away by the tide of history. Plain trees line the Canal du Midi as it makes a broad curve round the centre of Toulouse. On one side, the Minim district, birthplace of the singer Claude Nougaro. In the distance, the tower of San Serna, the largest Romanesque basilica in Europe. the railway station Matabio and busy streets leading into the rose-red city of Toulouse. People often compare Toulouse to Tuscany, and I think they're right. It's also said that Virgil came across the low-lying hills to Toulouse and wrote poetry there. I don't know if it's true, but it wouldn't surprise me. There's a very Latin aspect to this area, democratic and tolerant. It's a mixture of cultures. People are only scared of the unknown. This region has known all sorts of ups and downs, including the terrible religious wars. The silk routes to Asia are famous. Marco Polo and the big trading centers along the way are all well known. Well, here it was the tin route. We're right in the heart of the tin route and tin was essential for making bronze. It supplied the arms industry. Tin's raw material was mined in the British Isles. It came down the Vendée coast from Brittany and was then shipped up the Garonne. And that's why Toulouse was a major tin trading center. Toulouse took a long time to honor Riquet, the builder of the canal. And when it did, the statue turned its back on the water. On the way out of Toulouse, 
The canal passes the science district, where the engineers at CNES, the French space agency, design satellites for the European space effort. Ramonville saint agne has a large marina for the boating folk of Toulouse. After a couple of locks, the canal heads between its plane trees into the Laura Gay. This cereal producing plane is dotted with windmills and dovecots. Pigeon droppings were highly prized manure. In the 16th century, the Laura Gay made the fortune of Toulouse by producing the blue pastel, also known as Dyer's Woad. The local farmers sometimes irrigate their fields from the canal with or without permission. In the days when a mail boat took passengers from Toulouse to Agde on the Mediterranean, there were many inns and hostelries along the way. At the Negra lock, travellers could dine before they spent the night, and the stable supplied fresh horses to pull the boats. There is even a little chapel where they could pray. Not far from the canal lies the village of saint rome The chateau is surrounded by farm buildings and labourers' houses, illustrating every style imaginable. Toulouse, Flanders, the Rhine, Scandinavia, with a touch of the Moorish, all using the local red brick. The smooth progress of the canal required heroic engineering in the 17th century. One such exploit was the aqueduct over the river Herse. The Canal du Midi now climbs to its highest point, the rather flat col at Nourouz. On a hill to the left, you see the village of Avignonnet. It was here that in 1242, two members of the Holy Inquisition paid the cost of southern anger. During the Albigensian Crusade 20 years before, northerners had tried to crush the Cathar heresy by force of arms. Now Dominican monks were finishing the job, using paid informers, interrogation and torture, burning both living heretics and their dead bodies. One of the Dominicans, Guillaume Arnoux, accompanied by a Franciscan and other inquisitors, was looking for Cathars in Avignonnet. He was attacked by a troop of horsemen from the Cathar Redoute, Montségur, in the Pyrenees. The inquisitors were murdered and their files destroyed, but in reprisal, Montségur was taken by Catholic forces in 1244 and more Cathars were burned at the stake. Back to the present, where the Canal du Midi meets the 20th century. At Port Lauragais, the canal runs alongside the autoroute not far from the railway line. <laughs> Gradually, the sound of traffic dies away as we approach the heart of the canal. The ocean rock opens onto the stretch of water at Nauru's the highest point on the canal. That's not woman's work. This lock is a woman's lock because it's well cared for and fairly easy to operate. It's just what a woman needs to keep on form. No rules with its long lines of plane trees and the modest guardhouse, where the armistice was signed between Napoleon's Marshal Soup and the Duke of Wellington on the 18th of April, 1814. Here at Nourouz, the canal builder Riquet had ambitious dreams for a new town. And here, beside the watermill, the irrigation channel arrives from the springs of the Montagne Noire. 
This is the water that fuels the canal and makes it work. And at this point between the Atlantic and the Mediterranean, the water from the Montagne Noire divides. We move on towards the east and the charming village of Segala. The canal also has a past that no one talks about because it's a secret. It used to be used for smuggling. Going back a long way, to 1914. There were barges that shipped wine. In the wine growers' farms along the way, the bargemen loaded more than they were supposed to, or something like that. Anyway, after sunset, they sold part of the wine. The locals called it moon wine. But no one remembers that anymore. Mm. They called it moon wine. It was contraband wine. Once it has passed Nohouz, the Canal du Midi runs down to the Mediterranean, and the vegetation already begins to change. From the next lock can be seen the outskirts of Castel Nutri. The canal has changed department, from the Haute Garonne to the Old, and region from midi pyrenees to languedoc roussillon and in la bastide d'anjou a few kilometers from the capital of the Lauragais, we learn the secret of castelnaudry cassoulet <laughs> Now we use beans grown in sandy soils, as they were at Pamier, and a host of other local produce. To begin with, you need preserved duck, sausage from Castelnaudry, and a good Castelnaudry ham. You season it with thyme and garlic, which is excellent at the moment because of the dry weather, some good quality onions, cooking salt, which is much better than table salt, and milled pepper. Now start by soaking the beans for four hours. Cook the salted bacon, the ham, and the onions. Cook them three times for three hours. Now pierce the skin to check the cooking. Don't be afraid to wet it regularly with the sauce from the bacon, onions, and bone. Then off it goes into the oven to blanch, like a mini volcano. Finally, sprinkle on some milled pepper. Everyone has their own personal recipe, of course. There are three main ones, Carcassonne, Castelnaudry, and Toulouse. But of course, Cassoulet's original recipe actually comes from Castelnaudry, back in 1630. Castelnaudary, c'est un, une première respiration dans le canal parce que c'est un, c'est un grand bassin. Castelnaudary is the first special place on the Canal du Midi. It's an inland harbour. From Toulouse up to here, the waterway was squeezed in between the plane trees. 
The Castel Nodri Basin provides breathing space. It's also an important reservoir for the canal, providing enough water for the four locks at Saint-Roch, the eastern outlet of the basin. Castel Nodri has a fine succession of bridges. The Pont Neuf was built of stone and brick in 1802 in the classic style of the Ancien Régime. It opens onto the harbour, the terminus of the first section of canal, opened in the 1670s. This is the centre of Castel Nodri's old port. Hundreds of tons of corn were traded here. Next comes the Pont Vieux. Its single arch and round shape show that it was built in the 17th century, which doesn't stop it carrying modern traffic. The Pont Vieux opens onto the entrance to the Grand Bassin, an oval inland harbour, 400 metres by 300. Castel Nodri has become a focus for boating. A peaceful armada in white and blue is stationed here much of the year. Before leaving the town, the boatsman has some hard work ahead, the Saint-Roch lock. In four steps that are one of the engineering marvels of the waterway, the Canal du Midi falls nearly nine and a half meters. This difference in water level was once used to power mills to grind flour. We leave Castel Nodri in the company of an English couple. My, na my name's John MacDonald and my wife is Pat. Come out here. Um, we come from uh, Essex in England and um, we retired at the end of June this year. We left Essex near Harwich on the 30th of July and worked our way down the English coast. We then crossed the channel to Guernsey, Cherbourg, uh, Cherbourg, and then, and to, then, Guernsey, then to Guernsey, uh, around the coast of Brittany, Brittany coast, uh, and we some of the islands. called on Ile de la Moutier and Ile de Eau, and then uh, La Rochelle, uh, Royan, uh, into the river to Bordeaux, and then we entered the canal system at the lock at Castets, and came through the canal lateral, and now we're in the Dumidi. The Vivier Lock boasts not only flower beds, but also the last mill still operating on the canal. At the Criminel Lock, the walls are decorated with the homely art of the people who used to work on the canal. As we pass through Villepinte and Villesec, wheat and maize give way to vines. The Canal du Midi is approaching the Côte de la Malpère, to the south, and the Cabardès to the north. Limoux is not far. Welcome to the land of wine. The next stop is obviously Carcassonne. But originally, the canal avoided the town. Its council refused to raise the money for the work needed. It was not until the 19th century that the mistake was put right. The canal now runs past its victorious rival at the railway station by the Pont Marengo. Although the canal crosses the lower town, the true glory of the whole trip is to be found in the upper town, the walled city of Carcassonne. More than 20 centuries of history behind its walls. Carcassonne possesses the most complete example of French medieval military architecture. This spectacular construction has now joined the canal itself on the UNESCO list of World Heritage Sites. This recognition follows on from the extensive restoration work in the 19th century by Violette Le Duc, a highly imaginative precursor of the modern conservation movement.
Where do you come from? from? I'm coming from Austria, Vienna. Is it the first time you are on the canal? Oh, uh, no, 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 it's not the first time. We are the second time on a canal, but I stayed, I mean, 10 or 12 times in France, but in other parts, and not with boat. This boat is a second time. Another architectural monument marks our exit from Carcassonne. The canal bridge over the Fresquelle, the river that has run beside us since no rules and will shortly enter the river Old. The Fresquelle locks adjoin the massive bridge, separated by what looks like a huge stone bathtub. The Canal du Midi then ducks once more beneath the plane trees and winds its lazy way to Trèbes. The towpath advances as in a park towards the Vauban Canal Bridge across the river Orbiel and into Trèbes. Beneath the brown stone of its mills, the lock at Trèbes is like a water staircase. Three steps down and we sail into the Minervois. The river road is not far. This is the halfway point, 120 kilometers from Toulouse. The locks are now like lonely refuges, such as Aiguille, where flotsam from the canal has been carved into strange shapes. It's not like other locks because there are flowers and statues. How many sculptures? Oh, 30 or 40, perhaps more. And what's their story? Well, some of them are inspired by Georges Brassens' songs, and others just come out of my imagination. They're all in wood, carved out of cypress and plane trees, or pieces of wood I find in the canal or after pruning in winter. I sell some and I buy the carving tools I need and flowers to decorate the lock. It's self-financing. Up there, there's a monkey. And there's an owl. And there's Homo sapin, or pine man, near the road. The vineyards on both sides caused the Redorte Quay to be built. These buildings and storehouses were once filled with wine barrels. Here we see the doorway to a barrel maker's premises with his tools carved in the stone. The local people have tales to tell. Remember Louis? Batifol's car, a fish as big as that, at least a pound and a half. Ah, now you remind me, yes, I remember that. Batifol was a carp fisherman. He caught a lot of them. One evening, it was late, almost dark. He caught a carp, but didn't have a net to land the fish, which apparently was gigantic. So he came to my house to see if I had a net and a torch, because it was really dark by now. I didn't have a net, so I took along a hay fork to get the outsized carp out of the water. When we got back to the water's edge, the carp in question must have weighed all of half a pound. What a laugh! Still, we ended up having a good time that night. Oh, and Batifol really was a good fisher, and a good hunter, too. Just after the Dort, as the canal turns, there is one of the best-known constructions on the Canal du Midi, the Argent Double train sluice and reservoir. It was built in 1693 by Vauban, better known for his military fortifications, between the aqueducts over the Naval and the Argent Double, 
to take the frequent floodwaters from these two streams. The Argent Double drain sluice was purely functional in purpose, but it remains a fine example of the powerful architecture of the late 18th century. Next comes Homps, not far from Olonzac, one of the main towns of the Minervois. Before it was crowded with cruisers, Homps saw its quays full of thousands of barrels of Corbière and Minervois wine. It still says Wine Traders Quay on a sign. The town, a base for the Knights Hospitallers of St. John of Jerusalem, was one of the ports of Lesignan. To the north lies Minerve, the site of a mass burning perpetrated during the Albigensian Crusade by Simon de Montfort, father of the leader of the English barons. The town is perched on a spur of rock surrounded by gorges and is still visited by people who respect its tragic past. Lined now by umbrella pines, the Canal du Midi leaves Homps and descends through the Ognon Lock. The following stretch provides pleasant shaded places to stop. I come from the Haute Department. I'm not from here in the Hero. Do you see a lot of tourists? Oh, yeah, there are lots of pretty women on the boats. The men love it. In fact, that's all they come here for, to look at the girls on the boats. Well, they're not overdressed, are they? Oh, no, that's true. They're really nice. Next, the canal swings round an attractive hill, Pêche Laurier. Pêche, the hill, Laurier, the laurel tree, with cypresses, arbutus and myrtle bushes, too. Here, the waterway builders had to cut through the rock. Now we see the towers of the Argens fortress, where the canal enters the longest canal section without locks in France. 54 kilometers in a single stretch to the gates of Béziers. As the vegetation grows more Mediterranean, the villages have names like Rubia and Parazza. The canal enters the little valley of the Repudre. Here, the problem for the canal builders was how to cross the river and protect the canal from its flash floods. To solve it, Riquet built an impressive canal bridge, which local history calls the first one of its kind in the world. Now the canal approaches Ventenac in the Minervois. First the facade of a neo-Gothic chateau, then a wine cooperative that looks like a church with ivy-covered vats, testimony of the wine grower's faith. With no locks to worry about, the canal wends its way along the contour line between the vineyards, kilometer after lazy kilometer. The dream is pleasantly interrupted by the lovely bridge at Saint-Nazaire, perfect symmetry in stone. Many a village, indeed many a town, would like to possess such an elegant feature spanning their river. Now the canal widens for the mooring places of barges and cruisers along a masonry quayside shaded by plane trees. After the cheerful bustle of the harbour, as in the heyday of the canal, we reach the little village of Le Somai. First, there is its narrow bridge with a humpback that makes it almost triangular. And around the Pont Vieux at Le Sommeil is gathered a crowd of buildings for the canal's 17th century users when the village was a port for Narbonne. On the right, 
stables and hostelry for hungry and tired travellers. On the left, just before the bridge, the St. Peter and Paul Chapel, Riquet's first names, and an old boat building yard. <laughs> Le Somai is now a magnet for tourists on the canal. After the mail halt in Le Somai are moored boats of all sizes and colors. Two kilometers on, the canal crosses the aqueduct over the stony Patias, next to a former guardhouse. A few hundred meters further, the aqueduct over the Cess awaits us. The man who had the idea for this bridge, Vauban, can fairly be considered the co-builder with Riquet of the canal. He gave the work in 1689 to Jean Goudet, a master builder from Béziers. Back to the modern world of cruisers at the Port de la Robine, in an old section of the canal to the left. Now a decision has to be made, because here there is a choice of canal. We can either follow the Canal du Midi proper, or head straight for the Mediterranean via Narbonne and the lagoons of Bages, Sijon, Erol, to the coast at Port La Nouvelle. The latter choice means turning right along the junction canal built from 1781 onwards. We shall come back later. The section leading on towards Béziers is a warm, liquid avenue shaded with fragrant pines. Argelier is known locally as the birthplace of Marcelin Albert, the leader of the wine growers in the tragic revolt of 1907. In memory of the grapes of Roth, a memorial stands on the village square. Albert and his comrades could never have guessed that within a century, the longer dock would become the vineyard of the future and be called the French California for wine. Between high banks, the canal enters its third département, the Ero. In the bright light at the end of the leafy tunnel shines the limestone bridge at Pigas. This is one of the best preserved 17th century bridges built of masonry and fossil-bearing limestone. When the canal passes under the bridge at Cess, into the pretty little harbour at Cap Stang, it has been nearly 36 kilometres since the last lock. The boats sit in the shade alongside a quayside, where not so long ago barrels oozed the spicy flavour of the local grapes. It is really sad, the bateau? Oh, yes. Ah, oui. oh, yeah. Vous savez, les écluses euh, Et la vite. dans ces runes. Vous voyez comme ça devient propre. The boats get dirty. Oh yes, going through the locks. See how it cleans up. Oh well, it's not really a holiday then, is it? Oh yes, for me, a holiday is a change from everyday life. Next, a quayside cut into the rock, like the canal bed. The village of Poilès, with its town hall on the left, has a fine 18th century bridge. With never a lock in sight, the canal hugs the sides of hills. On the left, there is a long hill sparsely covered with shrub, but topped with cypresses. This is Anserune, with its hill fort, an important centre of Mediterranean civilization. On the flat top of the hill, there stood in the 6th century BC a town of nearly 10,000 inhabitants. 
Below the Enserun hill fort, the waterway runs into the Malpass hillside, a name of ill omen. Malpass means bad passage. This is the notorious Malpass tunnel, cut through a soft rock that people imagined would be the end of Riquet's dreams. This treacherous rock that now catches the reflections from the water bears witness to one of the canal builder's greatest achievements. While Riquet was seeking a way to overcome the obstacle, his adversaries got together and persuaded Louis XIV's minister Colbert that the enterprise was a failure. Riquet had gone mad and the whole thing should be stopped. The order to stop work left Paris and arrived just as Riquet finished rushing through the Malpass tunnel. The story goes that it took six days of Herculean efforts to put rough masonry along a tunnel 161 meters long, nine meters high, and seven meters wide. It's worth climbing up from the canal to see the strange circle formed by the crops in the fields below, in the plain. This is the result of the gradual drying up of the former Montadier Lake, another marvel in the countryside around Anserune. After Malpass and the village of Colombier, it's easy to see the effect of the budget cutbacks imposed on the canal by Colbert and the States, or Parliament, of Languedoc. Its width is reduced to what it was at the start, near Toulouse. At last a lock, and no ordinary one. Pont-Serain is a flight of seven, originally eight, locks, 312 meters long, falling 25 meters. Fonserran is a perfect example of that ambitious mixture of the functional and the majestic that is so typical of the Canal du Midi. And perhaps it's no accident that Riquet wanted to build it here to show off his technical skill to his native city of Béziers. For Fonserran offers a splendid view of the old city. Lined now by cypresses, the canal turns to run beside Béziers, where the Allée Paul Riquet, with a statue of the native sun, is a wide avenue used for strolling, parading, or fairs. The Saint-Nazaire Cathedral, a dun-coloured fortress with a slender bell tower, stands on the hill of the old city. The Greeks would have called it an Acropolis, the Romans an Oppidum. The houses rise up in steps with their old walls that may still remember the tragic events of 1209. The Northern Crusaders, under Simon de Montfort the Elder, slaughtered the population as an example to terrify the rest of Languedoc. Here we can see the most prestigious monument the 19th century left on the canal, the canal bridge over the river Orr, opened in 1857. It provided a definitive solution to one of the greatest problems and imperfections in Riquet's canal, how to cross in all seasons a river from the Cévennes that could turn in hours from dried up bed to torrent. Below lies the 19th century harbour that replaced the one next to the Notre Dame lock on a section of the canal now disused. Vous venez d'où, vous euh, Nous, on vient de Belgique. On a fait euh, les canaux euh, de France pour arriver... Euh, We've come from Belgium, down the canals to Lyon. That's where we took the Rhone Canal and came down here for the good weather. The downstream end of the harbour is close to Soclière, once the ground of the Bézier rugby team. 
As it passes Bézier, the canal moves between plane trees again. The waterway has little to show in this flat terrain so close to the Mediterranean. Few locks or canals until Portiragne. The Canal du Midi now comes to a tricky passage which required a unique solution. The canal crosses the Libran, a river that runs straight into the sea and is subject to flash floods. From the boat, it's hard to appreciate the arrangement of sluices invented in 1858. The towpath carefully skirts the stone bridges of a sort of gigantic Meccano set. Beyond the reeds, we see the Toisieux Bridge. Three eyes, like the three unmatching arches lined with volcanic stone of this humpback bridge built in the 1680s. The central arch is obviously designed to let boats through. The right-hand one is for the towpath, which is paved with basalt. But the purpose of the left-hand arch, hidden in the reeds, remains a mystery. At last we reach the harbour at Agde. On the quay stands one of the finest toll houses on the Canal du Midi, the Hotel Riquet. A modern bridge conceals what was once one of the technical and aesthetic achievements of the canal, the round lock of Agde. Why build a round lock? In order to serve three canals. The lock connects the Canal du Midi with two different levels of the river Ejo. Then the canal crosses that same river Ejo to reach its last lock, called Banyas, after the nearby lagoon, which is now a bird sanctuary. Only birds are happy in this watery wilderness. Past the old salt marshes at Banyas to the Port des Anglous, three kilometers on. In its final strait, the canal is caught between two expanses of water dotted with pink flamingos and smelling of the sea and tamarisk. Not far now to the end of the Canal du Midi. First through the old harbor, past the long low cream buildings dotted with black stone that now house the Glenons Sailing School. At the end of this basalt jetty stands the little red and white lighthouse that marks the end of Les Anglous and of Riquet's dream. Behind us, 240 kilometers of memories stretching back to Toulouse. Ahead, the Tau Lagoon, where the boatsman, now a sailor on salt water, can advance to Set, whose Mont Saint-Clair can just be seen. Set is the main fishing port on the French Mediterranean coast and the birthplace of the poet Paul Valéry and the singer Georges Brassens. Set is a little town with a history that goes back barely 300 years, so we don't have a glorious past like Béziers or Montpellier, which is probably what saved us. Set was founded by calling in people from all over the south. That's why we're such a melting pot today, a mixture of Portuguese, Spaniards, Italians, North Africans, and people from Yugoslavia. Look, the boats here are called the Pointu, 
or the pointed ones. They were powered by sails called latin. For centuries, that's how we fished and traveled. Then came the engine, here in the middle, and the propeller on its shaft. This is the boat used on the big lagoons at Tau, Bages and Burr. But there is also a quicker way of getting to the sea, because the Canal du Midi has its shortcuts. One is the canal off to the right we saw at Le Somai, which leads straight to Port La Nouvelle. The people of Narbonne insisted on this connection, which was built at the end of the 18th century in a splendidly classical style. Accompanied by the warm fragrance of the umbrella pines, the canal moves past Amphoralis, a museum of Roman pottery on one of the most remarkable archaeological sites in Languedoc. In the summer of 1997, a team of archaeologists and volunteers decided to bring back to life a portion of the city's glorious past by rebuilding a Gallo-Roman pottery kiln. They even managed to bake some vases and crockery of the period. This was a world first. <laughs> Next, we come to Salel d'Aude, with its harbour excavated by the great architect Gary Puy, one of the unrecognised geniuses of the canal. At the end of a splendid avenue of plane trees, Gary Puy also built one of the finest lock sites on the canal, Gailusti, with its honey-coloured stone like a Roman temple. Gailusti is both a doorway and a rampart. A doorway to the river Ode and a protection against its moods as we cross it to reach the Robine and move down into Narbonne. Our boat can now drift with the current, past a road where local kids come fishing for shad. The next lock is Moussoulance, which is quite clearly a fortification. These ramparts have had to stand up to the fury of the river Oud. Behind the heavy lock gates opens the Robine, cut along what a thousand years ago was an arm of the river. Narbonne, the former Roman colony, is not far now, only a few kilometers from the Roanel Lock, a meeting place for tourists of every land. Some have only had an hour's practice at steering on their way from Narbonne. The first hour or so driving the boat is a bit difficult. It's like driving a car when you don't have a license. The wheel's very different from a car steering wheel. Oh, but you pick it up very quickly. Now we can see the impressive Gothic cathedral in Narbonne. After the lock by the Dua mills at the entrance to the city, 
successive bridges display a variety of styles and periods. In the city centre, after the Narbonne Lock, the Robin passes the old Archbishop's Palace, and under the dark arch of the Pont des Marchands, what is left of the huge Roman bridge, rebuilt in the Middle Ages with houses and shops on it. The former capital of the Roman province of Gallia Narbonensis is worth a detour. The impressive Archbishop's Palace and the Gothic Cathedral of Saint-Just and Saint-Pasteur form one of the grandest architectural sites in France. Although most of the Roman buildings have gone, there are still many remains of the city's prestigious past. The Horium, underground warehouse, and the portico house at Clos de la Lombarde, with its magnificent murals, second only to Pompey's. Not to mention the Roman Via Domitia, a section of which was discovered in 1997 under the Place de l'Hôtel de Ville. Mooring alongside the busy tree-lined avenues that are a symbol of Narbonne's wealth in the early 20th century, the Bateau de la Baie often stops in Narbonne. C'est la dernière péniche à voir euh, la classe. Ours is the last barge on the Canal du Midi. A passer sur le Canal du Midi. To Il have a license for trading and merchant transport. Apart from us, there are four other working boats on the lateral canal between Bordeaux and the Jean. But it's true, we're the last boat on the canal to have a merchant transport license. I think it's a real pity, not being on the canal, but being the last. The hives are fixed, only the boat moves. They don't move on the boat, the boat moves them. Taking them through a region which is excellent for honey. All aboard for the Tramontane to reach our final port of call, Port La Nouvelle. From the barge, passengers can admire the restored keys of the Robin. The canal slips out of the city past the futuristic shape of the theater. On a good day, you can hear the crowd at the Stade de l'Amitié cheering the performance of Narbonne's rugby team. Ah oui, là ça va faire 10 ans que je travaille pour Sage Pajot sur cette sur ce trésor. I've been navigating this part of the canal for 10 years. Six months a year, I do this trip several times a day. It lasts four hours, from Narbonne to Port La Nouvelle. This reach is seven kilometers long. There are trees, vines, and a cycling track. After the Mandirac lock, the landscape will change. You come to a completely new world, the lagoons. To the left, beyond the Erol lagoon, rises the blue hill of La Clappe, an island in the days when people here spoke Latin. Behind the hill is the nearby fisherman's village of Guisson. Not far from the Tour Barbarous are the beaches of the Mediterranean. The Robin goes its way. The trees here have to fight to survive, leaning over to resist land and sea winds. In the distance can be seen the Ile Saint-Lucie, a zoological paradise. Then, beside the Robin, in a pine wood, a sign of human life, the Maison des Etons. School children come here to learn the names of birds and plants. 
Here we were at San Lucie, but really we're just elsewhere. We're only one hour's walk from Port La Nouvelle and one and a half hours from Madirac. We're not connected to the mains, water or electricity supplies. We live in a superb environment, surrounded by the noise of the crickets, an exceptionally rich animal life and water. We're at the heart of a cultural, historical and natural heritage. After this break, the Tramontane heads on towards the sea. Round a bend appears the last lock, Saint Lucie. Port La Nouvelle is the end of the waterway. The harbour extends for over a kilometre. Massive steel boats with gaping holes wait to swallow thousands of tonnes of grain, which once came by barge, but now are mile-long trains. Hands across the seas, the cargo ships at this end of the Robin often fly the Panamanian flag. But to reach the real end of our journey, to achieve that reassuring certainty that the journey could continue, we must walk along the concrete jetty to the lighthouse ringed in red and white, a bigger version of the one at Les Anglous. Now the lagoons are behind us. We can face the sea directly. For another voyage,